but is this the longest statement from the time to actually get the sentence? We've had some that have taken longer to get to court. But as far as trying the case, this is the longest trial I know we've ever had in the circuit. And frankly, I don't know if we've ever had a trial in South Carolina this long, a state trial. Could be wrong, but I don't know of any. Anything else? Okay. All right. Thank you all. And thank you, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's the prosecution's press conference that they gave after a successful conclusion of the case. The defendant, Timothy Jones, sentenced to death. And Bremner, um, it seems like a balanced guy, balanced prosecutor. Um, you know, they got out there, gave his accolades to the team, mm -hmm. um, talked about the emotional impact of the case. And in fact, even preparing that somebody may need to step out of the case because of that. Um, I don't know, maybe the prosecutors are getting soft today. We weren't allowed to step out. We, we, no, we right. handled it or we didn't have a job. That's right, exactly. He'd go do it, right? Yeah, but you know, it gave a, it gave a balanced uh, uh, press conference and also indicated that he has no ill will towards any of the other family members. They weren't the ones that did this, even though he disagreed with them asking for life. What are your thoughts of the conference? I thought that was good. I don't know why I was thinking about that Ted Bundy movie. There's been a few of them recently in documentaries. Remember the judge said, you know, I have no ill will towards you at the end of that trial and when he was sentenced to death, Ted Bundy down in Florida. Okay and said, good luck, young man, et cetera. I would have enjoyed having you as a lawyer in my courtroom. You know, you would have been, yeah. you know, excellent, yada, yada. But it's not quite like that, but you're dealing with somebody, you know, who's basically saying, they're family. You know, there's, that's the mother. You know, she's the one that's been victimized in this too, and she's basically saying she didn't want her husband to die, her ex-husband to die, and, other, and his brothers, et cetera, or at least one brother said that. And to say he has no ill will, I think, is charitable. Um, I'm sure that it was difficult because those people can be very sympathetic with the jury. Right. Judge, I'm curious. Um, I tried a death penalty case once with a judge who clearly did not agree with the death penalty law uh, of the state and uh, let the defense do basically run roughshod over the entire process um, oh. and threw <laughs> as many obstacles as, as possible at the prosecution. Tell me what happens when you're a judge or if you know somebody that's in that position. Um, does it affect the way you rule in a case like this or should it? Or um, is the fact that you're against it uh, something that you should maybe be more cautious about when you go forward with it? Does it change rulings? What do your, your, your perspective say about that? Judges have their own life experiences and their philosophies, but when we are, um, when we take the bench, we take an oath to apply the law of the state in which we preside. And so regardless of any personal feelings about the death penalty, if you are presiding over a death penalty case, as I have, you have to um, go by the book. You have to give a fair trial to both sides. Uh, but you absolutely um, need to guard against uh, allowing your personal feelings to influence your rulings. Um, each person, the, the district attorney, the defense attorney, the judge, we all have roles to play. And what I would say from my experience is that it's interesting that because these cases are so emotionally draining and exhausting in terms of the time necessary to prepare, I was struck by the, okay. um, by the professionalism and the courtesies okay. extended between the two sides. Excellent, Judge. Um, uh, sorry to cut you off, uh, but oh. you know, we got we got a tight time frame because we're moving so okay, quick sorry. here. We're in the fast lane here at the Law and Crime Network. So much breaking news. We're going to go to a quick break, and we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be here at 5 o'clock. I got Ann Bremner with me in studio. And, Judge, I'm sorry. Uh, just before the break, I had to cut you off when we were uh, talking about this idea of what it's like to be a judge who may be against the death penalty, but nevertheless, you swear an oath to follow the law and you handle those cases and, and please finish your thought okay no no problem um all i was saying was that we're we're trained that in a death penalty case our utmost responsibility is to make sure the law is followed and the procedure is adhered and so regardless of your personal feelings um, about the death penalty or the punishment or you know anything along the way your job is to make sure that a good record is created and that you get the case um, tried to the end, uh, hopefully without any error. 
Well, you know, Judge, you know, um, I've, been, I've been around the block a little bit and trying some cases in my, in my day, um, and especially when I was a baby prosecutor, as we used to call it, um, we would get certain assignments and rotations to judges uh, year to year, and there were some judges that were known as being pro-state judges, if you will, and pro-defense-oriented judges, and the rulings could, could actually, because of that perspective, even though they're following the same oath of office, the manner in which they're handling a case can have a dramatic impact on whether it's going to be assisting the prosecution or not. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. We have judges that have been former prosecutors, and they're, they're, they've had that experience. And so they're going to rule um, based on their experience as prosecutors. You have um, great judges, trial judges, who have been defense attorneys. And they are going to look at evidence um, from their former experience as a defense attorney. My point was simply, though, that once you get on the bench, you're not an advocate anymore, and you need to do your best uh, to follow the law and to allow each side to have its day in court. Right. And um, to the point I'm talking about with the pro-defense or pro-prosecution judges, um, you know, there, there were times that we'd be like, like, oh, my God, I got oh, judge. No. I, I got so, judge so right. and so. Blank, right. I'm going to have a rough year. Um, but, you know, to the judge's point, I have found, and I, I don't know if it's just my own personal uh you know, story, but the ones who were former prosecutors tend to become judges, become a little bit more defense minded mm -hmm. in my mind, and the defense lawyers tend to become judges that are more prosecution minded. Am I making that up? No, no, no. I think it's totally true. And, I, and in my jurisdiction in Seattle, there are a lot of former prosecutors that are state and federal judges and municipal. But I think you kind of try and go the other way a little bit to try and appear to be fair. I remember saying to a judge one time who I didn't think was fair, I said, Judge, can you be fair? And she said, I'm trying. And I said, then be fair. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, no, I'm really in trouble, you know, after I said that. But, you know, I think there's a little bit of that. When you're a prosecutor, and you've been a long-term prosecutor, I was a shorter-term prosecutor, but you kind of feel like I've just had this one road, and, and I, I've got to kind of look at the other side. And you kind of see the other side, maybe, once you become a judge and say, huh. Yeah. Now I can see where they're you know, from, Judge, you know? and, and let me follow that because, you know, we talk about, like, disparities and how things change over the 30-year career of, of, uh, that I've had. Um, and, and I found that there used to be a little bit more thought that went into prosecution um, when I was a younger assistant prosecutor, a little bit more of a philosophy of how do we balance the equities here? Uh, can there be mercy and compassion, but also deterrence? Um, and I, I find that it's, it's only become more of a one-trick pony by prosecutors. Are you, are you finding there are a little bit more um, just completely quote unquote prosecutors are not looking at other things as your career has developed? Uh, and, and, and do you think that there should be a change in some way about how the philosophy of prosecution is occurring? So I think to your point, um, I'll, I'll say this. I think when you have um, younger prosecutors that are assigned as courtroom prosecutors, they have a large load of cases that they're responsible for resolving. Um, in many instances, they don't have the discretion that a judge or a more seasoned prosecutor would expect them to have. And so they're less likely um, to, I guess, talk to the other side and, and to try to negotiate pleas. It's kind of like, this is what we're offering, you know, take it or leave it, which leaves you then with somewhat of a backlog when you can't resolve the, the, more, the simpler cases in order to get to the murders and the rapes and the kidnappings. Um, so I think in that regard, um, you certainly do see that inexperience does have an effect um, on the movement of some of the cases in the courtroom. Yeah, and, and when I was prosecutor, I tried to make sure that my lesser experienced prosecutors were under some very significant tutelage right. of, of seasoned prosecutors and that there was a uniform plea process. You could always move yes. if there were mitigating or aggravating facts, but I required they document it because what I found was that a prosecutor A in courtroom one would be giving one sentence right. and, and another prosecutor in another courtroom mm -hmm. right across the hallway on the same kind of case would be giving something draconian. And I felt that that was just unfair right. that depending on what prosecutor you got would, would make such a significant Difference. Well, exactly, and the, now they call that the early plea project, at least in my jurisdiction, where you basically, it's not vindictive prosecution by adding charges, of course, but it's basically, if you come first, come, come first serve, I mean, if you come in early and enter a plea deal, you're going to get a pretty good deal, and they have, like, dedicated prosecutors doing that, and so that's all they do.
Mm -hmm. So then you've got that consistency, you know, in a larger jurisdiction like Seattle. Because when you're in those little smaller courts, I think when you're the baby, the real baby prosecutors, you need a mentor, you know, in the outlying courts. I don't know if you had those in your office, but those the smaller jurisdiction courts within the prosecutor's office. I think that's where the disparities, disparities will happen more than in the felony courts. Yeah, and I think mandatory sentencing has had a lot to do with yeah, uh, some sure. significant changes. Judge, with respect to Timothy Jones, um, there's going to be an appellate process. We listened to the prosecutor talk about post-conviction relief as well as the appeal. Uh, are you seeing anything in this case that, that strikes you as being an area that would have any sizzle to an appellate court with respect to this case? I've always felt that with death penalty cases, the appellate divisions kind of look at it and get the feeling like, ah, this is an icky case or it's not, and then they may find a reason to reverse it if they're not comfortable with it. I'm sorry to say I do believe that that happens. Um, in fact, I've had appellate judges tell me that that kind of thing happens um, but this is five kids dead I, I don't see anything here that's going to be worthy of an appeal you I I haven't had an opportunity that you know to kind of review all the motions along the way I know that in Georgia you would have an opportunity to have your um, your rulings along the way ultimately reviewed before you actually go to the trial to make sure that you don't get through the whole trial and then have to start all over again um, but I would agree with you in, in a case such as this um, with five victims, um, it would seem that it would be unlikely that the appellate court would, you know, toss out the verdict and tell everyone to go back and, and start again. But on the other hand, um, when death is the ultimate penalty, as this defendant has received, the court absolutely wants to make sure that there were not any, um, any errors um, in the instructions given to the jury or any rulings that were made by the court um, before the sentence is actually carried out. Okay, excellent, Judge. Thank you so much for that commentary. And, and but I'm going to take a little bit of a sidebar right now because we got a lot going on in the fast lane here at the Long Crime Network. Okay, Mr. Prosecutor, that was in honor of you, although you gave a very lengthy closing and at times very passionate. Um, and I love this guy's style. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that the jury like is just riveted by this kind of prosecutor. Absolutely. I mean, he's got he's got the passion. I was just thinking about the purposes of, of sentencing. One of them is retribution. You know what, what he didn't really talk about, but he had the passion for it. But one is deterrence. We have also restitution and rehabilitation. But he's talking about deterrence. What about that other dad out there? I want any dad out there, your verdict's gonna resonate out there and it's gonna mean something to somebody and that should make you vote for the death penalty. And he said it in such a way that made you think, he's right, mm. let's make sure it doesn't happen to any other kid or any other five kids in the future. So Judge, tell me, um, in your experience of many, many years, and uh, now you're on senior status, but before that as a chief judge as well, having handled death penalty cases, what's it like to have a uh, the difference between really good lawyering in a courtroom that's in front of you as opposed to I'm sure you've seen cases where the lawyering wasn't necessarily up to that caliber. <laughs> so in a criminal case, if there's not good lawyering going on, it makes it really hard for the court because then you're worried about making sure that you're not creating an ineffective assistance by counsel you know, claim as we speak. Um, but in terms of a closing, the closing can make all of the difference. Um, you can have an okay lawyer who does an incredible closing and he can win the case. Now here, it clearly the prosecutor was on top of his game. But um, I, I've seen closings like his um, having presided in Atlanta in the South, you know, all the time. Very folksy, very connects with the jurors, um, you know, uses examples that, that the common person can relate to. Um, excellent closing. Yeah, I agree with you completely, Judge. I love it. Maybe because it reminds me of me and maybe a little <laughs> bit probably Ann Bremner, I'm sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Judge, Ann, it's been great having you on. We have handled so much here today at the Law and Crime Network, but don't go anywhere because the Daily Debrief with the great Aaron Keller is next. I'll be his guest. We'll be right back.